Hey, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Sorry about the slight tardiness this morning. We had a little bit of technical difficulties, but we are um, on track now. It's so good to see each one of you. I think a few more than those who are present uh, did RSVP, so I imagine a few more trickling in here as we go. Um, it, apparently, it is it is now fall in Portland area, right? Now it's, it's raining. Uh, it's finally here, and uh, of course, <laughs> yeah, thumbs up to that. Yeah, um, of course, all the decorations are changing everywhere. The leaves are starting to change, um, but uh, it, it sure changes at, at our home. It's just wet and lots of puddles everywhere. And we've got two dogs, and so that means uh, constant management of uh, of puppy dog uh, footprints in the house. But I'm glad to be here. I hope you are as well. We can gather this morning on the Sabbath day and spend some time together and reflect on God and His Word. I just want to uh, spend a little bit of time reiterating where we're at in this season. I know that we hear it over and over again and we're tired of hearing of it and we're tired of wearing our masks. But uh, we are still in the midst of a, a pandemic and there are regulations that we really have to stick to. Uh, in order to continue to gather, in order to stay safe. Every week, there's new stories which come up where um, faith gatherings happen and people come away uh, coming into contact with those that, that have COVID. And we want to do our, our best at ensuring that that doesn't happen. And so, uh, as you know, we are emphasizing that we wear masks or face shields. At all times, we're covering our nose and our mouth. I know that um, having a mask on for too long uh, can get frustrating and you're not getting the, the same air intake that you're used to. You want to take it down for the sake of everyone around you. And as we gather, we want to make sure that our, our faces are covered. Um, of course, we've got to keep our six feet of physical distance between one another. And, um, that's when I, I had to kind of break up a gathering in the foyer earlier, and probably you're, you're upset with me, and you're going to um, write, write it down in a book at home or something like that. Uh, Pastor Nick got out for me this morning, but I don't like to do that. And this is just another part of the frustrations of these times, but uh, we've got to look out for one another's safety, and we're, we're social creatures. We want to get together. It's, it's unnatural to have to to will ourselves apart, but we've got to be really, really careful, especially in these days. I just read last night in the uh, Adventist Ministers uh, Facebook group, this is a group of pastors from all around the world, there was an outbreak in, a, in an Adventist church, seven people got COVID um, last week, and the pastor went on to describe how they had signs up saying keep masks on, they had, and, and emphasizing this, the, the physical distancing and um, not making contact, but because they're a church family, they let their guard down and got lax, and they were hugging each other and laughing and taking masks down and, and everything like that, and then they had this outbreak uh, in the church. We do not want that to happen, amen? amen. amen. We want to just be, be careful, and we are bearing with this uncomfortable time that we are in. We're looking out for one another in the spirit of the golden rule. When it comes to today, we are going to be um, dismissing you by pew at the very end, and we'll make our way right out the door. We'll make sure that the area is clear for people to, to exit uh, uh, timely and, and, and well. Um, also, we are going to have the offering boxes up here. Um, uh, we can locate those. They will be up here as they have been. We're not going to be collecting offering for either children's ministries or our regular offering for the day. When it comes to the restrooms, we're wanting to make sure that there's no more than uh, two people at a time in the restrooms. And if you could take one of those wipes in there and wipe down any surfaces that you've touched, um, that would be a, a great thing. Let's, um, oh, there's one more thing I want to mention about um, all of these, these regulations. And that is, make sure, make sure that you RSVP every week. If you are regularly attending the RSVP every week, but then you decide not to, you're not going to be on the list. And we're, we have 50 people max, 
Um, and, and we can't assume that, that uh, Connie can read minds. She, Connie can do many, many things, but she's told me that that is not one of them. So every week you've got to call Connie, okay? Um, regardless of, of... Or text. Or text, yes. And uh, regardless of, of how regular you are or not. So make sure you call Connie every week and RSVP to either the 9 o'clock, which will be in here, or the 11 o'clock over in the Fellowship Center. Okay. Do you want to hear about what we're doing for Fall of the Star this year? Yeah. Yes. So we are not having our big Fall of the Star event down at the campgrounds. You can imagine the logistics and the challenge of, of doing that. Um, but what we are doing is we are partnering with the Oregon Conference, and we're going to make a special online video production. It's going to be different than Follow the Star, yet it will be clearly connected. We're going to tell the, the story of the first advent um, in a different and dynamic way, and the conference having a wonderful communications team with uh, high quality cameras and technical know-how to make it very dynamic. Perhaps you saw during camp meeting some of the um, uh, video abilities that the conference has. Of course, they have sound abilities too, but we're going to partner with them to make a special production which will go out at the regular Fall of the Star time. And that production is going to be about 20 minutes or so, 20, maybe 30 minutes. And then later on, closer to Christmas time, um, the conference is going to use that portion as a devotional, as a, a devotional focus in the midst of a, a, a bigger conference-wide Christmas uh, musical extravaganza where uh, the Fall of the Star, we're calling it Journey of the Ages this year, so people know that it's not Fall of the Star, but it's something reminiscent and different and sounds a little bit like it, but that will be featured um, as a part of this big musical extravaganza that will be broadcast to the whole conference. So, we're very excited about new possibilities with what we're doing this year, of course acknowledging um, the frustration of not being able to, to do Fall of the Star. It's just not the same. I mean, we should be Wally, we should be uh, announcing that we're going to go set up tomorrow, but, but alas, we're, we're not. So, what's that? It's going to be raining. It's going to be raining, <laughs> so, yeah, we're not going to set up tomorrow. So, stay tuned for some more details uh, regarding that. Um, also, we are praying and taking a step of faith that we uh, may be able to do a prophecy or evangelism series um, next year in February, March. Now, of course, we thought we were going to be done with all of this in, in a matter of weeks or, or a couple of months, but here we are. But nonetheless, we're going to take some steps forward, and Pastor Robert Zama, he is the Oregon Conference uh, evangelism, uh, Evangelist, excuse me, and he is actually going to come and share with us next Sabbath. He'll be here, uh, he'll be preaching and talking a little bit about how we can prepare for that series now. So I'm looking forward to having him here with us. And um, uh, looking forward to hopefully having another series where we can share the gospel with our friends and family and neighbors. I want to turn your attention to the bulletin. Um, and we have a second reading for a few people. So we're going to um, vote this morning. We have Leroy Klein going to Yakima Fairview Adventist Church. Don McConnell and Gussie McConnell going to Miamisburg SDA Church. Nancy Ethelbarger from, she's coming in from Walla Walla City Adventist Church. And then Robert Winter coming in from Walla Walla City Adventist Church. Um, I, I know that I've met uh, Robert or Bob and Nancy. Um, they haven't been here yet since we've, we've reopened here, but they're good people. So let's actually um, take each section one at a time, those who are transferring out, is there a motion to accept? So moved. Okay, is there a second? Second. All right, all in favor say aye. Aye. All right, and then uh, for Nancy and Robert coming in, is there a motion? So moved. Second. All right, all in favor say aye. Aye. All right, amen, amen. Okay, with that, I would like to turn our attention to the slide above and our we're going to have a call to worship and focus our thoughts heavenward. And our call to worship is this Psalm 57, 9 to 10. 
I will praise you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing to you among the nations, for your mercy reaches unto the heavens, and your truth unto the clouds. Amen. Be blessed this morning. Dear kind of Heavenly Father, awesome Son and Holy Spirit, we come before you praising your name for all the goodness that you have given us. For your mercy endures forever, your forgiveness is unfailing, and our sins are buried into the depths of the sea. Lord, we thank you that you are with us today. We, your broken children, have come to worship you, knowing that you are healing. You are the healer, spiritually and physically. And we need that in our hearts today. Lord, we also need healing for those who are among us, who are our family and friends and loved ones. We pray for Julie as her arm continues to to heal. We pray for Mark Azraf and Alan. And we pray for Kathleen. Lord, wrap your arms around them and touch them with your healing power that only can come from you. And may our hearts be open to blessing them through you. Lord, we pray for this COVID disease. We pray that our church will remain untouched by it, but find ways to bless others through it. Lord, we pray for our president and his wife and for our officials all over the United States and world, that they will make wise choices and that they will follow you and Lord, bless America because we are the land that chose you. And we continue to choose you and worship you and honor you and bring glory to your name in everything we do and say. Lord, we pray for the children around the world, children that are struggling to do their studies and struggling with abuse. Lord, you know they're in your hands and you see each one. Lord, you see our pain. Lord, and help us to relieve others of their pains. Lord, help us to be open to doing the work that you have given us to do. May we bear fruit in your holy name and be blessed by you. And may we walk with you hand in hand until you call us from those clouds of glory in the near future days, in your holy name, amen. Happy Sabbath to each of you. Glorious, it's raining. Yeah. Isn't that nice? Yes. This is the first time I've had long pants on since <laughs> early June. Just thought you'd like to know that. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Lang, did you put up the uh, vision and mission? There you go. We want to keep this our focus. So I would like us to read it together. Can it stay up, Michael? I'm not doing anything. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Because she wasn't even near the computer when it went ahead and changed. Together? Are you looking? Gladstone Park, seventh day. We don't have a microphone. microphone. We're still alive. Okay? <laughs> Gladstone Park, Seventh-day Adventist Church, is where we are growing and serving 
in our mission statement. Let's do this together. Connecting with Jesus, connecting with people, connecting people with Jesus. The most important thing is our connection. Right? That's the most important thing. And then connecting with people. So then we can take that next step once we become their friends to invite them to join us. In these days of COVID and all these things going on, you may think that the leadership of the church has been yawning and taking naps. We have not. We have spent thousands of hours in committee meetings which I'm not a committee fan, but we've been spending time in committees. Probably several years ago, we started a vision team. We came up with a lot of different things. Two of the things were here, and I have to tell you, being on that committee, when we were especially coming up with the mission statement, we had a mission statement, and we liked it, and we were just getting ready to vote to say, this is what we're going to do. Suddenly, someone said something, and it changed to this, just like that, right after we had prayer. God is still with us. Amen. We've got to remember that. And we went from that committee to a Growing Together committee, sponsored by the conference. And in that committee, do you remember some of the things that we did? The pastor had a circle, a green circle, with six different things. I'm sure none of you remember those, but keychain leadership, empathy, everything Christ-centered, warm relationship, prioritizing, best neighbors. Is it ringing any bells back with the sermons that the pastor may have in that? And these two committees have kind of worked into a mission strategy team. And we're working to try to prioritize God's church. And what we found is the vision team message went right into the growing together, which just went right into the mission strategy team. God is working, even though you may not see it. And one of our focuses is prioritizing things. And we're trying to focus how can we meet some of these things? And I think the best way as we've done our studies is in small groups. Because see, all those things we talked about there, teaching leadership, everyone who's a leader in this church should be mentoring someone to take their place or to start another group. Empathy. Small groups is where you can have empathy because you can talk to things. Here, where you're all looking at me, and I'm looking, trying to look at all of you at once, and I can't. But in a small group, you can do that. Warm relationships. That's what you do in small groups. And this mission strategy team, have you noticed they're trying to do some outreaches into the community? That's part of being good neighbors. So your church leadership has been very busy. And I'm serious when I say thousands of hours that has been put into this. And we're trying to figure out ways that we can still move forward with our church in these times where we're separated. Now I'll actually get to the offering. Today's is world budget. And part of this offering goes to the voice of prophecy. Equipping the world for Christ to come. The voice of prophecy exists to proclaim the everlasting gospel of Christ, leading people to accept Jesus as their personal Savior and nurturing them in preparation for his soon return. As the voice of prophecy looks to the future, they will continue to focus on sharing love of Christ with the hurting world. Have you noticed people are interested in listening to what you have to say if they know you're a Christian? So we seem like we can't do anything. It's not true. We have 
two offering baskets. One is for our tithes and offerings, and the other one is for our children's ministry, children's offerings. Father, we just thank you for your continued blessing upon our church. We thank you for a dedicated congregation. That even though we're only here for a short time, we're still willing to spend our energies, our efforts, our monetary supporting your church. We ask your blessing upon your church. Help us to seek ways to reach out to others in the precious name of Jesus. And that reminded me of Revelation 4 and 5, the worship service in heaven, where the Lamb was at the center of worship. And it says, because He is worthy, He purchased us with His blood on the cross. Those thoughts have just really made this song precious to my heart this morning, and I hope that with that little explanation, it will all also touch your heart as you listen to the words. Wonderful, merciful.
trebles? No. Oh, I think that is a yes. <laughs> Have any of you ever had a blown head gasket? Anybody go through that? That's so annoying because it's just a gasket, but it's at the bottom of the engine, and whoever's repairing the engine has to take the whole thing apart and get to the head gasket, and, uh, and they, they charge you a lot of money for that. Now, when I was uh, a student out at seminary or in Michigan, I wasn't prepared for that. I didn't have an emergency savings account that would cover that. I was, uh, along with Emily, we were living paycheck to paycheck as um, uh, poor, poor students as it goes. Um, and so when this happened, it, it took us by surprise, of course, but we were literally at the mercy uh, of, of others, at, at the mercy of the Lord, really, and, and we spent some time in prayer and uh, I had somebody reach out to me, just check in with me, ask how I was doing, and I explained the situation. And to my surprise, he decided that he was going to pay for my mechanics bill. Now, if you've had your head gasket go, you know the price tag is very, very high. To have something like that happen is a huge act of mercy. It brings relief. Have you ever been in any other situation where you were at the, the mercy of others? Maybe you needed somebody's help because you couldn't help yourself in the situation that you were in. How many of you like or liked Mr. Rogers? <laughs> have you ever watched that? Yeah, Bryson's watched that. Bryson knows about Mr. Rogers. Well, there's a quote that, that comes about every once in a while. Maybe you've heard it, but it's one of my favorite Mr. Rogers quotes when it comes to challenging things happening in the world. He says, when I was a boy and I would see scary things in the news, my mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping goes without saying that we have faced many, many challenges this year. And we have two and a half more months of this year. What could happen? I don't know. But we've, of course, had this pandemic. We've had the fires. We've had natural disasters, poverty. We've had unrest. But in all these situations, of course, the, the news likes to highlight the terrible, the awful. But if we look closely, we can see the helpers, those who are being merciful, those who are bringing relief and aid to those who need it, support. Now, when we look to the issues around us, we have two routes that we can take, two ways of approaching it. One is going to keep us close in step with Jesus. And another will harden us in our hearts toward the spirit of Jesus. When we see the suffering of people in this world, we can say, not my problem. I don't have anything to do with it. This is not my business. Or we can say, how can I help? How can I be a helper? I was in an interesting situation this week, one that I'm not proud of. Because I found myself in a situation where somebody was asking me for mercy and I failed. I'm just going to disclose that to you so you realize that I too am human. I had a woman approach my car asking for some money for some food. She wanted to get something to eat and I immediately gave her my typical often true response, and that is, I don't have any cash on me. Usually, I don't have any cash on me. She uttered a desperate expletive and walked away. Now, I don't usually have any cash, but after she walked away, I thought, wait a minute. I think I do have some cash, and I looked down, and there it was. But the moment it passed, and I looked around, and I couldn't see her anywhere. Now, I know that in my heart of hearts, I was actually just wanting her to move along, if I were to be honest with you. I was in a selfish mode. But if 
I had allowed Jesus in that moment, perhaps things would have turned out differently. I was convicted of this, and I repented and prayed about this for a while. You see, we have two choices when we see those who are in need. We can either say, not my problem, not my business, or how can I help? Let's flash back to the middle of August. It seems like years away now, doesn't it? But we had our uh, community impact day, which we're going to be having next Sunday as we're finding out needs that there are in the community. But there was a team who got together and made sack lunches for the homeless. And then that team took those sack lunches out and took them to the homeless, the needy in Gladstone and Oregon City. But the challenge is there aren't a whole lot of homeless individuals who will gather in Gladstone or Oregon City. So after we all had lunch, we uh, sent sack lunches out to uh, with, with a few people in the, in the broader team, and we went out into the Portland area. And Judah, my son, he's nine, and I took a couple of bags full of sack lunches, and we went on an adventure. It was a mission of mercy, as the hymn goes. And as we drove northward toward Portland, we got onto Powell Boulevard, and I had never really been on uh, Powell east of 82nd, but as we drove westward, we stumbled upon camp after camp after camp of homeless individuals. And these were uh, camps that were located in vacant parking lots along Powell, um, places obviously meant for parking, but full of tents, full of people. So Judah and I um, pulled up in one of the camps and we started handing out some sack lunches. And for us, it was, it was an easy thing because we had the resources, we had the sack lunches, and all we had to do was hand it out. But we were humble, at least I was, and Judah and I talked about it, as we saw the relief that came over people's faces when I handed them a lunch. In fact, we had a leftover Costco pizza, and uh, you know, I saw this family, and the pizza was sent home with, with me for my family, but I thought, we don't need this pizza. And so I, I handed the Costco pizza out the, the window, and I heard another expletive, but this one was one used in relief. She was very happy to get a Costco pizza for her family. But there was a woman, I'll never forget, she was in her late 50s, early 60s, and she struggled to get out of her vehicle. Um, she was all alone by herself, and there were flies swarming around her van, and she was so grateful for that little sack lunch. And, and she took it and said thank you and went back into her van. When you involve yourselves in situations like this. You see that the need is, is great. And you realize that though what you do may just be a drop in the bucket, it makes a difference when you decide to help those who need mercy. Ellen White says this in Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 23, where, uh, page 23, excuse me. She says, there are many to whom life is a painful struggle. They feel their deficiencies and are miserable and unbelieving. They think they have nothing for which to be grateful. Kind words, looks, looks of sympathy, expressions of appreciation would be to many a struggling and lonely one as the cup of cold water to a thirsty soul. A word of sympathy, an act of kindness, would lift burdens that rest heavily upon weary soldiers, excuse me, shoulders. And every word or deed of unselfish kindness is an expression of the love of Christ for lost humanity. Two choices when we see a need. Not my business, or how can I help? But Jesus says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. We're in the midst of a series on the Beatitudes, and uh, this is the one in, in verse 7. And Jesus is calling attention to the merciful. And often when we think about being merciful, 
we think about um, giving forgiveness, which is a part, but mercy has a lot to do with compassion. And if you are compassionate, you're going to be forgiving. If you're forgiving somebody, you're being compassionate as well. But he says, blessed are the merciful, they shall receive mercy. And it's interesting to consider what Jesus made a priority in his life. When he heard of the sick or of the needy, he healed and he met needs. When he heard of sinners, when he heard of outcasts, he ate with them. He spent time with them, and these were all acts of mercy. He made it his business to be merciful. But how did the Pharisees respond? How did the religious elite respond? This man eats with sinners. This man breaks the Sabbath. This man is getting in the way of our religious code. And friends, if mercy and compassion is getting in the way of our religion, then maybe we don't have the religion of Jesus. Jesus is merciful. And by the way, condemnation is not a fruit of the Spirit. It is not a good mission strategy. Maybe you had success with condemnation, I don't know, but it is not a good mission strategy. Looking to Jesus, we see a contrast between he and the religion of the Pharisee or legalist. To them, to the Pharisee legalist, it gets in the way of the religion of Christ. When we see the suffering, the needy, or the sinful, and we furrow our brows, or we wring our hands, or we turn a cold shoulder, we are putting ourselves outside of the alignment of the gospel. God isn't on the prowl looking for someone to condemn. Satan is. God is on the prowl looking for someone to save and redeem and love and serve. As I mentioned during announcements time, we have two dogs at home. We have a new puppy. She is a... Uh, 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 she's a, a lab. She is uh, part golden lab, part uh, silver lab, both purebred parents. Sweetest dog, but maybe we're comparing her to our other dog, who is pretty wild. But this week, Lady is her name. Lady is her puppy's name. She had an accident in my bedroom, on the floor. And as you can imagine, I wasn't happy about it. This is revealing more Pastor Nate to you as well. Wasn't very happy about it, and I brought her over and I scolded her in uh, my loudest, deepest voice. I said no. And Olive, who is used to me saying no to her, came running up and got in between me and Lady, and her ears were down and her puppy eyes were all big, and she put her paw up on me as if to say, It's okay, she didn't know any better, she's going to be all right, don't get mad at her. It was, it was really interesting. It was, it was very obvious that she came to the defense of, of Lady. She was almost saying, Dad, be merciful. Be merciful to her. Throughout the ages, it has been God's people who are connected with God, who go on missions of mercy, who make mercy their business. That is our calling. I want to turn our attention to the radical mercy of Job. Job has his own book in the Old Testament, and, and Job was considered to be blameless, to be righteous. And often when we think about that, we think of obedience to the, to the Ten Commandments, which is good, which is right. But Job goes above and beyond. Listen to what he says. He says, I delivered the poor who cried for help, and the fatherless who had none to help him. The blessing of him who was about to perish came upon me, and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. I put on righteousness, and it clothed me. My justice was like a robe and a turban. I was eyes to the blind and feet to the lame. I was a father to the needy, and I searched out the cause of him whom I did not know. 
pausing there, it's so easy to be merciful, maybe to those that we know, but Job sought out the cause of him he did not know. And then finally, verse 17, he says, I broke the fangs of the unrighteous and made him drop his prey from his teeth. Job was all about missions of mercy. Job made it his business to be merciful. And so what do we do? How do we put ourselves on the side of Job, on the side of Jesus, on the side of God's calling? And how do we disassociate and put ourselves out of alignment with the Pharisee or the legalist? We firstly need to know and believe with all of our hearts that God is merciful. Do you believe that God is merciful? Amen. Yes. Amen. Jesus showed that. It was mercy, it was compassion, which moved Jesus to leave heaven to come into this world. And his whole life is marked by mercy. It was mercy and compassion that moved Jesus to submit to the abuse of humanity and death on the cross so that he could save us. We were alone in our sin. We were in a helpless situation, and Jesus in his mercy left heaven for you and for me. Romans 5 tells us, for while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person. One would dare even to die, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Mercy. The mercy of God. You may say, oh, Pastor Nate, you don't know my history. You don't know my challenges. You don't know my mistakes. You don't know what I've done. You don't know my habits. You don't know my addictions. You don't know my problems. And you're right. But here's what I do know. I know that you can say with me, Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Hebrews 2 verse 17 tells us that Jesus is a merciful and faithful high priest. He's not looking to get us out of, out of heaven, to keep us out. He is eager to show his mercy to us. Hebrews 4 16 says this, it says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive what? Mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We don't confidently go to the throne because of who we are. We don't confidently go to the throne if we're focused in on our mistakes. We go confidently to the throne when we know with all our hearts that God is merciful, that Jesus is merciful, and that he delights in giving us his mercy and in saving the one who has a great need. We need to receive the mercy of Jesus, which will transform our hearts so that we become then merciful in this world. Now, we also need the Holy Spirit to transform us, to change our hearts. I needed the Holy Spirit to change my heart this week in that situation I found myself in. But when we seek and pray that God would baptize us in, our, in His Holy Spirit, it's the Holy Spirit that changes our character and works in our hearts and in our lives to make us more and more like Jesus. And if there's any need that we have, it's not a repair of an engine, it's the repair of the heart. We need the Holy Spirit. Now, mercy has a lot to do with bringing about relief. Have you ever played that awful uh, schoolyard game, Mercy? You know about that, that game where, where you lock hands with somebody and you, you try to twist the other person's hands until they say mercy? I, I grew up in, in public school. Maybe it's a public school thing. I don't know. But it's terrible. And, and you, say, you say mercy when you want relief. 
Mercy is what we need. You say uncle. Okay. Yeah. Same concept. Uncle. Mercy. But mercy has to do with bringing that relief. We cry for relief. We cry for mercy when we need it. But who around you needs relief? Who around you needs mercy? Is it someone in your family? Is it a neighbor? Is it someone in your community? Relief may be a tire that needs to be changed. Relief may be giving somebody a hotel stay. Relief may be giving somebody a bed to sleep in. Relief may be a dollar bill or a bite to eat. Relief and mercy may be a band-aid or a drink of water or wearing a mask. Jesus calls us to be merciful, to bring relief. Some years ago, well, it was 10 years ago this summer, I was in Atlanta for the general conference session in 2010. Um, and at the general conference session, that's when the World Church of Seventh-day Adventists gets together, and we vote policy, and we also vote leadership. And uh, as we uh, gather there, that was when our current uh, general conference president, Ted Wilson, was, was voted in. But uh, Emily and I were staying in a hotel. We were helping out in the convention center where it was, uh, where the uh, general conference was being held. We were handing out uh, ministry pamphlets and things like that. Uh, but between the hotel and the conference center was the CNN center. And this is where CNN News is based. But at the bottom of that building um, was their food court. And it was open, it was like a, a food court in a mall. And so a lot of people would go to the food court, they would come back to their hotel or wherever for lunch or, uh, or, or during lunch, and they'd come to the food court as well uh, for their meals. But I remember I was, I was crossing the street. I wasn't really even going toward the CNN Center because you can just go right around into the convention center. And a man stopped me and he said, Sir, sir, sir. Can I have some money for a sandwich? Can I get a sandwich? And praise the Lord, I was in the right frame of mind that day. I said, you know, um, I don't want to just hand over money. Let's, let's go get you a sandwich. So I had in mind that I was going to go into this food court and get this man a sandwich. We go inside. I don't remember which restaurant it was, but he, I said, go ahead and order your sandwich. And he go, go, gets up to the counter and he says, Okay, I will take a chicken sandwich, a large fries, and the biggest milkshake that you have. And I thought, well, okay, this is bold. He's being bold, as bold as, the we, as bold as we should be, coming to the throne of grace. Wasn't anticipating buying the sandwich, or, or buying all of that, but I went ahead and did it. Because it was clear that he was in need, he was very hungry. And I'm not saying that to toot my own horn, but just to illustrate that, that God calls us from time to time to be merciful, to help those in need. Proverbs 3.27 says, Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due, when it is in your power to do it. But sometimes people need more than relief. They need more than a sandwich or a meal. Relief is something that brings about help for a moment. And relief is often what we do when we go on mission trips. But sometimes people need a complete rehabilitation. They need education or, or training so that they can get back on their two feet and they can, they can function. Rehabilitation is what can reset the course of someone's life. It's also merciful. Think of Jesus. He goes and he heals the blind, the lame, the sick, the needy, the lepers. But he also then gained disciples and followers of them and ushered them into a new way of life and sent them out to make more disciples. Think of the parable of the Good Samaritan. A man goes down the road, and he's attacked by robbers, he's left for dead. And a priest and a Levite make sure to go around and go to the other side of the road, walk on by. For some reason, the priest and the Levite were, were safe along that road, but not this man. Not my business, not my problem, they must have thought. 
But the Samaritan, when the Samaritan approaches this man, he, he goes and he helps him. He brings him relief. He brings him mercy. He binds up this, his wounds. He cares for the man. He takes him into town. But then the Samaritan takes him into a room, to an inn. And he covers the cost of his care. He says, take care of this man. It wasn't just a matter of, hey, let me give you some water. Hey, let's put some band-aids on it. But he brought him the care that he needed so that he could be rehabilitated back to health and get on his way again. And then the Samaritan says, I'm going to be back, and he, and he leaves. He leaves the man at the end, and he says, I'm going to cover all the costs here. We're not all in a position to do something as radical as that. But the Samaritan goes away, perhaps he went to deal with the attackers, perhaps he went to go have a word with the, the Levite and the priest, I don't know. But nonetheless, the Samaritan in the story is the one who brings mercy. And Jesus shares this with his disciples. He shares it with you and me. And there's a, a cold and selfish and indifferent religion of the Pharisee, of the legalist, of the self-righteous. And then there's the religion of Jesus. The merciful. James 1.27. Did I miss James? I didn't put James in here. I'm just going to read it to you. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. This is true religion. And sometimes when we think about being unstained from the world, we think about maybe don't watch certain things on TV or watch certain movies or listen to certain music or read certain things, and, and, and that may be the case. But what if James is talking about the attitude of the world? The attitude that's so prevalent, especially right now, that it's all about me. That it's survival of the fittest. And that it's, that it's me and my kingdom. James is pointing out that religion is all about mercy. And Micah, of course, sums it up. He says, he has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require? Of you, but to do justice and to love what? Mercy. Love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. This is countercultural. This is the way of Jesus. This is Jesus' religion. Jesus says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Now, what, what is he saying there? Is he saying that if I do good works, then I will be saved? Well, we know that the rest of the Bible makes it clear that we are saved by what? Grace. We are saved by grace. But James also says that I will show you my faith by my works. We have righteousness by faith that is the grace of God, but then it produces in us good works. And Jesus seems to be saying here when he says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. The merciful are those who have made God's mercy their own. And in the very end, we're going to look into the eyes of Jesus face to face. Amen. We're going to be at home with Jesus. So. I've shared some stories in the past of a mission trip I went on to Mexico. And there's one that I haven't shared with you. It's, it's really brief, but we went to a schoolyard. And we brought a bunch of fruit, and we brought a bunch of clothing for, for children in need. We were on a mission of mercy. And we thought, well, we've got a bunch of oranges. This is no big deal. But when we arrived and we took out the oranges, we realized that it was a big deal. It was a huge treat for the kids, and they surrounded us. There was no room to move because the kids were so eager to get an orange. We played catch with them with the oranges. Some of the kids just dug right in and, and chowed it down and got all sticky with orange juice. But what we came away with was a realization that if only we were so eager about God's mercy as these children were for these oranges. And we realized that in being on a mission of mercy, it brings us in step with Jesus. And that conviction that we get about our own pride when we see those who are in need 
Mercy comes. Mercy comes and changes us. It is mercy that changes us. It is those who are merciful who are on the side of Jesus. And in the end times, in the final days, which we very may well be in the midst of, we're going to find mercy in our last hours as we endure trials like never before endured. And ultimately, we, if we are merciful, if we are in step with Jesus, if we are in Christ, as the Bible says, we are going to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. So our challenge today is this. Will we remain selfish? Will I continue to ignore those who ask me for a dollar? Or will we be changed by the Spirit of God to be like Jesus? Answer that question in your heart this morning. I want to close by leaving you with the connection question for the week. Every week we have a question that's, that has to do with the sermon, but it's something to think about this week. And so as you talk with friends or family, wrestle with this question this week. What can you do to make sure you are intentionally compassion, compassionate toward those who need mercy? In other words, how can you ensure that you are in step with Jesus, that you indeed are being merciful? With that, my brothers and sisters and friends, let's close with a word of prayer and ask the Lord to lead. Our Father in heaven, thank you for your great mercy in reaching out and leaving heaven to save. Lord, you knew our helpless condition and you came and Jesus became a human and endured the temptations and trials that we face day by day, but he was perfectly victorious as he trusted in the Father. Lord, I pray that the heart of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, the mind of Christ, would be in each one of us and that day by day we wouldn't get jaded or bitter by the world that we are in, but that we would be rooted and grounded in you that we would be merciful and so being we would hang on to that promise that we will receive mercy Lord we love you we praise you and we see your mercies all over the place we pray that your will would be done that you would, that you would bless us that you would keep us and your kingdom will come we love you and we worship you we pray all this in Jesus name May the Lord bless you, my friends. Uh, have a happy Sabbath. And uh, as we said, we're going to be uh, exiting out this way. And Bill's going to come and dismiss you uh, pew by pew. And make sure um, not to create any congestion right here. Let's make sure we can get out. Um, is it raining right now, Bill? Sounds like maybe it's not. Anyway, God bless you, my friends. Have a happy Sabbath.